I'm J.D. Lenzen, the inventor of fusion knotting. I've been challenged to go through 15 levels of complexity with knot tying. Level one, overhand knot. Make a loop such that what we call the running end of the loop is on top. Then on the opposite side of the loop, you're gonna tuck it through the back. There's a lot of variations that can spin off of this basic knot. The first is a stopper knot, where you tuck through the back of the loop about three or four times. Then you're gonna pull. A stopper knot can also be the top of another variation of an overhand knot called a square knot. We're gonna take one side and go over the rope next to it and then around. Then we're gonna take my left side and that's gonna go underneath and then around. Going into the next level, we're going to increase complexity ever so slightly by showing you how to make a bowline. Level two, bowline. The way you do it, you're going to make a P. The leg of that P is on top of the loop. Then this end would go around the body, up through the P, through the rabbit hole, and then around the back of the standing end, some people say around the tree, and then it cuts right back down that rabbit hole. The bowline's a very useful knot for when you want to create a loop that's fixed, but it doesn't cinch up when the loading end is pulled on. Last thing you want is for you to be in a challenging situation where you need to be rescued, and all of a sudden, as this helicopter or truck tries to yank you out from where you are, you're fundamentally being cut in half. Level three, slip knot. You create a loop, you're gonna generate what's called a bite, just a bend in the rope. The bite is gonna tuck through the back of that loop, and then we're gonna cinch it. What sometimes happens is, People will have a line on the bottom and they'll try to tuck through the bottom. And as you can see, it kind of just falls apart. If it's on the bottom, tuck it through the top. If the original loop ends on the top, tuck it through the bottom. Now, a lot of times people think a slip knot is kind of an inferior knot because it slides. Slip knot, dare I say, is even more useful than a bowlin or any other fixed knot. Think about the sweater you might be wearing while you watch this video. That's all basically created with a series of slip knots. The shoes that you might have tied this morning, those are a series of slip knots. So next, what we're gonna see is how we can take a square knot and make it slightly more elaborate by tying upon itself in a form of a tie that's classically called a Solomon bar, or more recently called a Cobra knot. Level four, Solomon bar. So what we're gonna do is create a bite. Then we're gonna split those cords left and right. Take our right cord, we're gonna cross it over the two lines. Then we're gonna drop our left cord over that line and then tuck it through the back. Take up the slack in that to make sure it's nice and firm. Then you're gonna take your left line, cross it over, drop the right line over the top, tuck it through the back, and then tighten that up. And you have your first overhand knot around the two middle cords. You're gonna continue forward, crossing that right cord over the two lines next to it, dropping the left cord down over it and tucking it through the back. You're gonna continue this technique just as before. Solomon bar could be a belt, could be a necklace, a bracelet. So many different utilities. Next up, a real clever way of taking a slip knot and turning it into a linear line. Level five, the zipper set. You're going to make a bite, then you're going to go right over left, and then you're gonna take another bite and you're gonna tuck it through the loop. Then I'm gonna do something kind of slick. From here, you're gonna take the fixed end and you're gonna slide that through the loop. But before I tighten it with the sliding cord on this end, I'm gonna pull this out slightly. Then I'm gonna create another bite that punches through and I'm gonna pull that one taut. So moving forward, all I gotta do is make a bite with the fixed end, slide it through the loop, then cinch it down. And it creates this really beautiful, almost organic looking leafing structure as you move down. And I'm gonna create what's referred to as a double overhand knot. Now the reason why we call this a zipper sinnet is best explained to you through demonstration. You untuck it and then watch what happens. One of the things I really like about knot tying in general is a few of them go from a usefulness back to the cord with a single pull. You come to recognize that these tools have so much opportunity to generate so many different things. Level six, the trucker's hitch. You're gonna take your line, it's gonna be fixed off at one point, then make an overhand loop and you're gonna create a slip knot. This slip knot is fixed on this end. It slides on this end, but that's okay. Then what you're gonna do is take your other end and you're gonna fish it through that loop. 
This right here becomes where the mechanical advantage is achieved. Now, once I get the sufficient amount of tension, all I have to do is just take my thumb and then create what's called a half hitch. Now that one half hitch will lock this trucker's hitch in place. But just to be sure, I'm gonna do the same thing in reverse. What that's gonna create is a full hitch. So I went from a half hitch to a full hitch with a line in series, creating a trucker's hitch. Now a trucker's hitch is achieving a mechanical advantage by creating a series of pulley points without the pulleys. So if you're strapping something down, a trucker's hitch is really the way to go. Going into the next level, we're increasing complexity by adding two ropes together. Level seven, bends. A bend is fundamentally when you want to connect two pieces of line or rope. Starting off, I'm gonna show you the fisherman's knot. You're gonna take one of the lines and place it in front of the other line in opposite directions. Go over the line next to it and then itself, and this is very important because you don't wanna come up between the two, and then through the loop that you've created. Look familiar? It's an overhand knot. You're gonna cinch that tight then you're gonna look at your other side. And you're gonna do the exact same thing in reverse. Once you create these two overhand knots in opposite directions, you pull the load, they slide into each other. So this is a great way of adjusting the length of a cord or a necklace around your neck. In some cases, you might find yourself needing to connect two pieces of line that aren't the same size. We're going to make a six with our green rope. We're going to make a nine take the six and put it on top of the nine. You're gonna go down and then up through the middle. And then here, it's gonna go up and down through the middle of that loop. Once you've generated this configuration, you're gonna pull your standing ends to create a Zeppelin bend. And then when you're done, you can separate the rope ends with ease. When I'm tying a practical knot, like a bowline and a Zeppelin bend, I find the utility really inviting. But there's nothing that really draws me in from a cultural perspective. When we talk about more decorative knots or pieces that have spiritual or sacred significance, those draw my attention. They're like acquaintances that I miss and in some cases want to celebrate. Level eight, the double coin knot. There's so many elaborate decorative pieces that can be created from the double coin knot. It's also the base of many traditional knots from Mesoamerican cultures, Germanic cultures, Eastern Asian cultures, and the British Isles. I'm gonna start at the middle of my rope. I'm gonna make a P with the left side. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the right cord and I'm going to cross that eye, just like a finger in front of your eye. Then this end is gonna go under point one, then over point two, under point three, over itself, and then under that last point on the bottom. You can see that diamond pattern in the middle. But I wanna point out that I didn't fish for the end of my rope. I just took a bite and threw that bite through it. Then I pulled it out. It's a little trick of the trade. For our next level, we're gonna take the double coin knot and we're gonna expand it longitudinally as if two coins overlapping wasn't enough. Level nine, the prosperity knot. The prosperity knot is kind of a clever knot. It's a historical knot in the sense that it's been around for quite a long time, but its structure is very similar to a fusion knot. So in a way it is kind of a historical fusion knot. Now, as far as its utility is concerned, that's really up to someone's creativity. To transition a double coin knot into a prosperity knot, you take your running ends and you're gonna pull those out to the side. Then you're gonna take up a little bit of slack. I'm gonna pull that down and then I'm gonna take up a little bit of slack on this side. What that'll generate is kind of like these wings on the bottom. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this bite that's down here and you're gonna go left over right. I'm gonna go over to your left side and repeat the same thing. So then you're gonna take this loop and it's gonna go underneath the left edge of the loop next to it. And this rope is gonna travel over the eye of that loop below. And then you're gonna fish this over that rope end and through the bottom of the end next to it. And it's gonna create this kind of configuration. Now all we have to do is take our left side of our rope, we're gonna go under point one, over point two, under point three, over point four, and under point five. I'm gonna pull that through to generate what is referred to as the prosperity knot. Is it a decorative knot? Yes. Can it be used for utilitarian purposes? Absolutely. Once you understand the fundamentals of the weave, you can actually reorientate it into a variety of configurations. While we're on the subject of decorative knots that are sacred to various cultures, I thought it would be really interesting to show a knot that's referred to as a snake knot. 
Level 10, the Mystic Snake Knot. You take your top cord here and you're going to make a loop. Then you're gonna take your bottom cord and line it up with that top line of the loop. And then this right here is gonna punch through and generate, you guessed it, a slip knot. You're gonna take your right cord and you're going to curve it to the left all the way around the piece. Then this cord here is gonna come around the back and then down the left side. Then you're gonna take up the slack, tightening it nice and firmly. Then you're gonna continue forward just like that. This particular piece, a lot of the technique is in the adjusting, making sure each knot, as you stack it on top of each other, is adjusted proportionally to the one below it. If one knot is loose and the other knot is tight, you'll notice a difference. I'm gonna show you how you can transition from this color, this yellow, to the orange beneath it. The way you do that is you press the yellow pieces to the middle and the orange pieces to the outside. And you're gonna do the exact same technique, except now you just change the color. This is one of the first times I'm illustrating a knot that you could spin your own creative input into. The details, and the nuances, it's your choice, your creative vision. I finish it with just a square knot, snip it there, make a torch, glass those ends. And then you have this, tucks through, and there you have it, a mystic snake knot made into a bracelet. So now we're gonna move into the advanced knots where we're gonna take sinnets and slip knots and overhands and square knots and we're gonna mix them all together to make something more elaborate, more detailed and more complex. Level 11, the spindle fiber bar. The name comes from during cellular division, there is something called spindle fibers. My background is biology. And so when I was looking at the way these interlocking hitches looked, it looked a lot like spindle fibers to me. First, you're gonna take two lengths of cord my blue length is about six feet, and this one's about three feet. I'm gonna bend our short line, creating a bite at the middle of the cord. Then I'm gonna take our long line, put it behind, I'm gonna cross over, drop this one down, and then I'm gonna tuck that through the back. And this, fundamentally, is just an overhand knot wrapped around two parallel lines. Then I'm gonna take our cord on the right side, twerk it underneath the cord adjacent to it, and through the loop created. And that is just a half hitch. Now notice I don't tighten that up yet. We're gonna leave that loose for now. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the line on the left, I'm gonna go over the line next to it, I'm gonna fish for the end, and I'm gonna go down the loop associated with that half hitch on the right, and I'm gonna go up. So I've created another half hitch, but this one goes over, behind, and then up, through, and this one goes under, over and then down through. So this demonstrates a little subtlety about half hitches. Just because they're half hitches doesn't mean you can't do them two different ways. This same technique is repeated all the way down. And so once again, the complexity isn't in the actual technique, but as the pattern extends itself, it starts to create something synergistic. So the whole is bigger than the parts. Just like before, we're gonna snip off those ends, take our torch, and with the center strands, it's just gonna do a double overhand knot. Just as a side note, I always like to leave a little bit of tether at the end. For our next piece, what I plan to show you is a little bit more advanced than the spindle fiber bar, but it's gonna take those fundamental methods, in this case, a half hitch that may one day save your eyes. Level 12, emergency snow goggles. Your emergency snow goggles to reduce the amount of UV light that enters the eyes and subsequently saving you from going snow blind. Start off with half hitches stabilizing the base and then full hitches along a right end line and along the left end line. You're gonna take your right cord, it's gonna tuck underneath the two vertical lines, then over and through the loop created. Then take the left cord and you're gonna tuck it underneath and then over and through the loop created. This is the middle point where the bridge of the nose will go. Then moving forward from here, take this line and you're gonna go over the two vertical lines above it and through the loop. Then you're gonna go under the two vertical lines above it and through the loop. Now doing over and then under with a half hitch is going to generate a full cow hitch. It's also called a lark's head. You're gonna continue this pattern moving up the strands above until in this case, you generate six stacked 
full hitches. As a side note, many people mostly encounter cow hitch or a lark's head off the middle of a rope, but you can also generate it as shown with a single strand in one direction. You just have to know how the knot is oriented. Same thing on the other side, and then to finish it, you're gonna go underneath, over the top, and through the loop created, creating a half hitch. And I know you're thinking this, so I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Yes, they can double as superhero masks. Let's hypothetically say that you made your way down from the top of that mountain, but you still have some survival needs. All you need to do is just pull out that last loop and you have all your cord ready to go and to be utilized for your next challenge. Level 13, the backbone bar. So the backbone bar, it's a counterclockwise looped slip knot and a clockwise looped slip knot that is sliding on two central strands. This slip knot is going to be the place that you tuck both of those ends of cord through. And we're gonna flip it over. Now remember how last time I did the slip knot so that the running end was on top? This time I'm gonna do the same thing with the running end on the bottom. And I'm gonna slide that loop through. You're gonna tuck both of those lines through the loop. Then you're gonna turn it over and you're gonna do this one on top. This is kind of a cool technique, not only just for its usefulness, because this is the most basic form of a backbone bar. The backbone bar is, no pun intended, the backbone of other types of ties. Now that we understand the fundamental principle of the backbone bar, I'd like to show you the next level, taking this technique and utilizing it in the form of a cylindrical pouch. Level 14, the utility pouch. So just as we did with the single bar, we're going to go ahead and take this line, we're gonna tuck it underneath, we're gonna bite that through, make a slip knot. And the slip knot is gonna slide over the two lines in front of it. We're gonna to rotate to the next position. We do the exact same thing, we're gonna pull that tight. We're gonna to continue to do this moving forward. It's like a slow motion spiral made with slip knots. To finish the top, all you gotta do is widen that hole just a little bit Fish for your end and tuck it through from the inside out. Take my end, fish from the inside to the out. I'm just gonna do an overhand knot, a double overhand knot. Turn it around, we're gonna do the exact same thing. Once you've generated that, don't need all this extra cord. Take a little torch lighter. Utility, this goes in your pouch and then this goes around the belt. Level 15, bush sandals. So the bush sandal is an elegant combination of a lot of the different elements I've already shown you today. We're gonna show a full hitch, overhand knots, and we're gonna have one of my favorite knots, the slip knot. For each sandal, it takes about an hour and a half with a little bit of leeway, I would say about three, three and a half hours for both sandals. Sometimes people have come to me and said, why would I wanna make bush sandals when I can buy a pair of sandals? That's a great question if you have a store nearby. But in some cases, you might find yourself out in the bush and dumped, say, for example, in mud. In one instance that I personally had, I was able to pull my feet out, but I wasn't able to get my shoes out. So I found myself with socks and nothing else. What you're gonna need is five 20 foot lengths of paracord or any cord for that matter. I made a cow hitch at the middle of the four cords, you're gonna take your rightmost cord and you're gonna go right over left, creating that familiar nine with the loop on top, tuck through a bite, creating a slip knot. That slip knot is gonna go over the cord immediately to the left. Then you're going to take the cord that you just wrapped, make your nine, punch through your bite, and go over the cord to its left. And then you're gonna cinch that up you might be seeing a pattern forming here. You're gonna continue this all the way until you reach the leftmost side. Once you've done that, you take the entire piece, you flip it over, and then you do exactly the same thing as you did before. This is what your mat's gonna look like. The last knot being tied here. We're gonna take this toe and we're going to compress it in. And that's gonna be a protection for the front of your foot. It's also gonna help kind of lock it in place in the front. You're gonna take your left cord and go over your right cord to make an overhand knot. Then you're gonna tuck your left cord under the right cord and over, turning your overhand knot into a square knot. Continue moving up, left over right, and then left under right. And you'll notice the front of your shoe slowly curling 
over your toes. Once you've generated the last knot, you're going to measure out an equilateral triangle. Take a little tool called a splicer. Go down in between the knots just like that. This is going to come over the top where you will tie, you guessed it, another square knot. The sandals themselves feel really good on the feet, kind of like those beaded backs that you put in cars and it triggers kind of pressure points on your feet. It feels really nice. I do not consider knotting a finite field to study. I consider it like poetry. You can reconfigure them in any way you want, creating your own prose, your own music, in your own way. As you start to reconfigure what seemingly is simple into more elaborate configurations, you start to see things start to emerge. What I'm showing you is not a finite field to study. It's really your opportunity to play and discover.